the ethics of reproductive technology. And when you see the play this afternoon, you'll see why these ethical issues are relevant. So to tell you a little bit about Dr. Bowman, he works in the field of clinical ethics, and he specializes in end-of-life decision-making and cross-cultural healthcare delivery, as well as genetics, genomics, is that how you say it? That's right. Genomics, <coughs> cloning, animal ethics, and ethical questions in emerging medical technologies. He has been consulted on these topics in countries such as Iran, the People's Republic of China, and South Africa. He is a clinical ethicist at Mount Sinai Hospital, and also holds an academic appointment with the University of Toronto in Family and Community Medicine. He also serves with the University of Toronto Joint Centre for Bioethics and the University of Toronto Centre for the Environment. Mm. So welcome, mm. Carrie Bowman. Thank you. Thank you. This is so good for a Saturday. It's <laughs> <laughs> great to come out for this. I graciously was invited to see the play last night, and I had to work late, and I haven't seen it. Did you so, see it louder? Okay, I was invited to see the play last night, and I was given tickets at Bayan, and I had to work late, and I haven't seen it, which might be good, because I'm, I'm terrible for doing the spoiler thing. So I haven't actually seen it. So you don't have to worry about that. I really have not seen it. I did find a bit of a clip about it on YouTube. But I'm not so much going to talk about the play as I am going to talk about in vitro fertilization because that is the essence and the core. And I know what the play is about and I've read about the play, but I have not seen the play, okay? So in vitro fertilization, uh, fertilization within glass, okay? It's actually not that new. We, we're now going back to the 70s, we've had that, this. But the technology is really, really advancing. And you know, the first person to talk about, the abbreviation is, of course, IVF. IVF is mm -hmm. in vitro fertilization. The first person, almost bizarrely, to talk about this was Aldous Huxley, when he wrote Brave New World, 1932. He described it almost to a T. He described it almost to a T. Did he make it up? Was his knowledge of science that insightful? I don't know. But when you read the actual quote from Brave New World, I think a pro I've read Brave New World, not recently, mind you. I'm, I'm sure some of you have. Okay? Um, so, so quite amazing. And so the concept, so what actually is in vitro fertilization? I'm going to give it to you straight and simple. Uh, egg meets sperm outside of the human body. Okay, now egg meets sperm, we know that story. That's why we're all here. Okay. <laughs> and usually, but not always, that takes place within the human body. Um, now for many people, or some people, probably not a majority, for a variety of, variety of reasons, a woman can have blocked, you know, fallopian tubes, whatever it may be. And so then what happens is the eggs are extracted from the woman uh, the sperm is given by the man, and the two are put together. I'm simplifying it, but, but probably not that much, actually. It's not something you could do at home, but, but still, this is the basic mechanics. Egg meets sperm in a Petri dish. Um, you then, if it is successful, you would then have a small, if things go very well, a small group of embryos, but very, very early embryos, just at a few days, okay? At a few days. Those embryos are then examined in terms of, you know, th th here's where the technology is really, really changing. Right now, and this is changing very quickly, they look to see how those embryos look in terms of morphology, actual appearance of the embryos. And they're not bad at predicting which ones look decent, healthy, and well. Uh, they are then selected, and the word would be transferred. Transferred meaning implanted, but the medical world word would be transferred into the uterus of the woman. Okay? Then, if all goes well, and you know, let's be honest guys, success rates are not to this day, brilliant. Uh, you're really only looking at 40% of things go quite well, okay? Sometimes lower. It, it depends on a lot of other factors, but it's not a given at all that this is going to work. Uh, then pregnancy occurs, okay? 
just as any other pregnancy occurs. And hopefully, if the pregnancy is healthy and well, the woman goes to term, okay? Um, and due date, which is 40 weeks, or, you know, term is lower than 40, 37.5, and then 40 weeks, and a healthy baby is born. <coughs> so if you cast your memory back to the 80s, I was an adult in the 80s, some of you were too, okay? <laughs> you know, when, I, when I speak to my students at the University of Toronto, the 80s, oh my God. <laughs> this is ancient history. <laughs> They don't know the 80s from the 60s. Uh, they really, really don't. But anyway, it's actually lower than that. It's 1979 was the first... Remember the term test tube baby? Yeah, yeah. okay, that's IVF. And, and back in 79 and into the first few years of, of the 80s, there was what we in ethics would call the yuck factor. Oh, test tube babies, what kind of a world are we living in? And when these children grow up, uh, you know, will anyone talk to them at school? Will anyone marry them? You know, there was a lot of very ridiculous questions, actually, that were associated with this. The yuck factor, this isn't a very sophisticated term, but I think you know what I mean by the yuck factor. It really, really wore off. And test tube IVF children, I'm just doing some math in my head, and I'm not good at math, are... Yeah, they have reached the age of 27, 28 now, okay? So, so there are many young people in our society that were born through in vitro fertilization. And if we now look here at 2016, I can only imagine that virtually all of you either know friends, neighbors, or people in your family that have made use of in vitro fertilization, okay? So not, in and of itself, not so incredibly shocking. Uh, there's still religious groups that don't love it, believe me. Egg meets sperm outside the human body. This is not, this doesn't sit well with some religious groups, okay? Um, but having said that, when you have a healthy couple that absolutely have made a very strong decision and commitment to raise a family and are unable to do so because of biological processes. And there's a couple of different reasons, but it could be old infections or something that's keeping this, this conception from occurring. So you move that out of the human body and you move forward. But what I want to talk about now is some of the complications, okay? I want to talk about what, what we're looking at now in the 21st century because technology is now changing. So I have never seen this in Canada. I want to be very clear or even heard of it in Canada, but mix-ups is what hits the news, is that, you know, you are storing embryos um, in cryopreservation, deep freeze essentially, right? You're storing embryos and human error occurs and in fact the embryos are mislabeled and in fact these, have, these, these incidents have occurred. I don't know of any in Canada. And to be honest with you, I work in one of the fertility clinics and I can tell you the amount of checks and balances and double checks and balances and triple and quadruple checks and balances is so extreme, I can't even imagine ever an accident like that occurring. <coughs> but it has in other places, okay? So that's one. But there's always these remote stories of babies that get mixed up in the hospital too, right? A lot of parents fear that actually. Uh, but it's actually happened a couple of, it, it hasn't happened often. Um, and again, I've never heard of mixed up babies in Canada, but I, I've certainly heard of it in other countries where it has occurred. Okay, so that, that's one, but I, believe me, this is not, <laughs> from a risk factor, this is not the top of the list. Anyone want to guess what the biggest challenge has been with in vitro fertilization? Please. What do you do with the, the ones that aren't implanted? Yeah, in what do you do with the ones that aren't implanted is, is absolutely quite massive. So, so let me talk about that. So let's imagine you get six, it's a little high, but four, five. I'll settle on five. You get five, a couple moves forward and decides that they want to have a family. They've got five <coughs> decent, I know this sounds ridiculous to talk about decent looking embryos, but this is the language <laughs> that is you. You've got five, six decent 
five decent looking embryos. Uh, they want to have two children. So let's just look at how that moves forward. Um, now, it's very costly, and until uh, December 15th of 2015, uh, you had to pay for it at all times. Ontario is now covering uh, one cycle of in vitro fertilization. It will now be covered on OHIP. I can talk more about that later on, okay? It hasn't been before this, and it can be very, very costly. So here's one of the biggest, and I'm going to tie into what you're saying. One of the biggest risks, believe it or not, with in vitro fertilization is multi-fetal pregnancies, meaning twins, triplets, or higher. Now, what is risky about a twin? Some of us are twins, right? There's got to be a few more. Okay. Yeah. All right. Statistically, and by the way, as, the, as, the, as groups get younger and younger, and you ask twins, it's more and more and more people, right? Um, and triplets used to be incredibly rare, or almost no one knew a triplet. Now, uh, they're out there. Um, why is that? Because, let's imagine you've got five decent looking embryos, and the goal of the parents is to have two children. And they are paying for the transfer and the action of the transfer. So the question then becomes, how many embryos will be transferred? So success rates are not great. So if in fact you transfer two embryos, then in fact you increase your chances, but you also really enormously increase your chances of having a twin pregnancy. Now, when you say to parents, you know, have you thought about the risk of twins, very often, potential parents I should say, uh, the response is, risk? Are you crazy? I can't think of anything better. We've had 10 years of infertility. Uh, we've taken out another mortgage on the house. We have borrowed from everybody we know. Twins? Hallelujah, right? But here's the thing. With, with, you know, the, with twin pregnancies, they're, they're not enormously high risk, but they're higher <coughs> risk. And the biggest risk is preterm birth. So 50%, 5-0% of twins uh, are preterm. Okay, 50, 5, 0. Now, a lot aren't, so what comes with pre It depends how preterm, but they can come very early. And when they do come very early, you know, into... And remember, the technology now that we have, if a baby... And I'm sorry, I don't know pregnancy in months very well. It, you, it, you know, in the medical world, you never talk months, you only talk weeks. So I'm going to have to use weeks, because I, I don't even really know how to convert it in my mind. Um, 23 weeks now. How many months is that? Who's good at math? Okay. Five-ish. Okay. Uh, that's now what's called the age of viability. So many but not all babies born in 23 weeks uh, can now survive on life support machines. Okay? Now with that survival, some may do okay. Uh, others will have physical, cognitive deficits, potential blindness, deafness, cerebral palsy. And if it's twins, then you, you've got that potentially for two of the children, okay? So that's, that's the far end. But as you get higher and higher towards 37 weeks, to be honest with you, some of the newer research just coming out this year is showing that even babies born between 34 and 37 weeks have some noticeable differences as adults in many but not all cases. Now, people used to think if a baby was born at 35 weeks, who cares, that's fine. As long as they're healthy, it doesn't really matter. And it is fine, but as they grow older, you do see some significant differences, not with all. So the amount, and here's the thing, if, if IVF is successful, and you've had a two embryo transfer, uh, your chances of twins go from about one in 90, which is generally the human ratio for twins, um, to 40%. Yeah, so it's very high, okay? Very, very high. So then you also have parents that will say, we are next to broke, um, we've got three healthy embryos, we don't want to leave one behind, okay? We've got three viable embryos, we can only afford to do this once, transfer all three. Okay, then you run the risk of a, tripl a triplet pregnancy, and a triplet pregnancy, the risks go up again, and the chances of preterm birth rise even higher. Most triplets by far are preterm. Uh, it's very hard to get to term, 
You know, human females are not well designed for multiple births at all. They are designed mostly for singleton, with the occasional ex exception of twins, and the higher stuff is very, very difficult for human females. Because, you know, when you think of uh, the obvious, you know, the humans upright, forward, this is not what most <laughs> mammals do, right? Okay, so there's a lot of... Uh, it, 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 it's very different, actually, than, than what occurs with, with many of the creatures in this world. So, that is one of the concerns. But going back to your, your very important comment, what do you do with the extra embryos, okay? So, if a person successfully has a family, and let's imagine they, they want one or two children, they are born, they're wonderful, they're very happy, there's three embryos left. Okay, here are the options. One, discard them. Easily. It's not hard to do. They can easily be discarded. Okay, two, you can donate to research. This is where stem cell lines come from. And, and, and you know, regenerative medicine in which um, you don't need that many embryos. It's kind of a myth that, you know, you need all kinds because you can actually use the, stem, the, the cells repeatedly over time and the cells reproduce but they can be donated to research. So if you've heard of stem cell, this would often come from excess embryos. And a stem cell is a cell that can, boy, it can do a lot of stuff. We're not really there yet, but you would program it to, you know, if, if your knee is torn apart in terms of its cartilage, and you take a stem cell and you're able to program that for the knee cart cartilage that is damaged, you could then inject that in and the cartilage would regrow around your knee, and you would be as good as you were. Your knee would be about as good as it was when you were 20, okay? Myocardial infarctions, heart attacks, right? Same thing. We're not there yet, but those are the kinds of things, Parkinson's, brain cells, those are the kinds of things that stem cell could likely do. It's very controversial, and many religions, again, are very against this because... The concern is the destruction of the embryo is very problematic to many people. Okay, so you've got discard, you've got um, research, um, you've got donation. Why not donate? So there's people out there that can't even manage embryos. They, they, women that don't produce eggs, men that don't produce sperm. So there's couples out there that don't have the option even of IVF. So why not? give away your embryos so that someone else would have a chance to have a child, perhaps as you potentially have struggled to have a child yourself. Some people are more than willing to do that, but here's what must be considered. <coughs> Those children are biologically your own. Okay, someone else would carry them. Okay, some other person, woman, would carry them. Couple, perhaps, would carry, physically carry, I mean gestate. But when that baby is born, that baby is your own. And if you already have two children, that is literally a direct sibling to the children you have, okay? So if you were even to do that within, let's say, Toronto, and you, you donated, let's say, three embryos, <coughs> they're out there, okay? <laughs> they're out there. And your children that you're raising, in theory, could meet those children, and if they ever married or something, you'd have problems, right? Because they'd be marrying a direct sibling. Um, some people are okay with it and say, look, I struggled so, so much to have children in my life. I, I'm, I'd do anything to take that off someone else's shoulders, and so I'll donate. The fourth, which Canadians are very good at, is the option of let's do nothing, okay? Um, so, yeah, just leave it alone. Uh, you would need to pay the cryopreservations, that's a decreased fee, somewhere around $125 a year, okay? More or less, give or take, and you would pay that fee, and just leave it alone and let time go by and you could, can you see where that one's going? Okay, so there are already embryos out there from the 20th century, okay, 80s, 90s, um, that whosever embryos they are, the fees stopped being paid some time ago, the phone no longer answers, okay. <laughs> 
So what's a hospital to do? Say, no, no, we don't have a visa number, throw them out. Um, legally, absolutely, the hospital's in a position to do that. And I should not be saying this publicly, but they don't throw them out. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, they don't, because it's too ethically complicated. But here's what's happening, is in this country, and especially in the United States, hundreds and now thousands of embryos in cryopreservation, deep freeze, are piling up. Yes, please. Is there a best before date? No. <laughs> no. I'll tell you, the, the only, no, it's actually not a bad question. It's actually not a bad question at all. I'll tell you, the, the cryopreservation techniques before the millennium were not as good as they are since the millennium. There's a new process called vitrification. The ice cells were problematic to the embryos. So ones that are before 2000, more or less 2000, are not as wonderful in terms of their viability, generally, than after the millennium. But to answer your question directly, if we continue to do nothing, Canadian society in the 25th century is going to be dealing with this problem. They could stay for hundreds and hundreds of years and still be transferred and be born into healthy children hundreds of years later, if not thousands. Okay? So, it, yeah. <laughs> so children that were actually conceived, so to speak, in, let's say, to the millennium, 2000, uh, could be born into the 24th century or something of that nature, if nothing is done. Yes, please. I'm wondering why they are stored and frozen as embryos instead of separately as eggs and sperm. Well, because they needed to be created as embryos so that they could be assessed to make decisions about which ones to use. Because you need to make a small group of embryos. You need to put egg and sperm together to create a single egg and a single sperm is, is just not a reasonable thing to do because success rates are so low that you need to do it with, with groups of them. Sperm coming groups. Sperm does, but eggs don't. Eggs. The other problem is embryos age and store very well. Um, eggs don't. It's getting better, but eggs, the sperm does. Eggs don't. Um, yeah. So, but I, so I think eggs and sperms are frozen yes. for other reasons. Yeah. So someone goes through, like a young person goes through cancer. Cancer. Yeah. So I don't know technically whether it's a different process, but. Yeah. Yeah, eggs and sperm are frozen, and we do that all the time. Uh, younger people with cancers, without question, when we have, I don't know, 19 or 20 year olds facing major cancer and radiation, without question, we will store gametes, meaning eggs or sperm. I want to be clear though, guys, the success rate of this, particularly for eggs, is much, much, much lower than it would be for embryos. Okay? But a lot of 20-year-olds are in no position for embryos because you need a partner and they're just starting out in life and they may not have a partner. And do you try and find one? Do you, you know, here's where it gets really tricky, right? But but the long the long term, there are a lot of embryos out there, okay? Out of those four things, so one is discard, one is research, one is donation, and one is do nothing. Which do you think is the most common occurrence out of those four? <laughs> you got it! Yeah! Just, this is very complicated ethically, and we're going to do nothing. Now, some people don't see it as complicated. Some people say an embryo is, is, is nothing. It's not human life. Um, others and other religions will say... You know, an embryo is the same level, the Catholics would say an embryo is the same level as human life as every one of us in this room. There's no distinction. <laughs> Others would say a lot are more gradualist. You know, an acorn is not an oak tree, okay? But it is an element of an oak tree. Um, but a lot of people, although you might not have thought it all through, it, it, because I don't know if you've thought about this a lot, but a lot of people are a little closer to the acorn. Mm -hmm. way of thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a respected aspect of human life, but you may not see it as human life equal to the person sitting beside you. Some people do, okay? Some people do. So there's one of the things that is going on, and that's one of the challenges with it. The other thing that is occurring is, is childbearing can now be greatly delayed. 
greatly delayed. So if a person has embryos, they may be the person's own or they may be somebody else's. But we now have, and is no longer rare, what we call postmenopausal pregnancy. Now, if I was standing up here in 1985 talking to you about postmenopausal pregnancy, I'd probably be laughed off this podium because it's a ridiculous, contradictory term, right? No longer. Postmenopausal pregnancy is occurring increasingly frequently. Don't need menopause is not the problem. You need embryos. So what, in fact, could occur is that the the, the uterus of the woman. Uh, is prepared with various hormones or whatever, and then the embryos are transferred into the postmenopausal woman. And what ages am I talking about here? I'm talking, well, it's variable, but easily mid 50s and up to 70s. Into yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's been, there's been twins at 75. Um, yeah, so, and you know. The human body, the human female body, um, you would think is going to freak out with a pregnancy <laughs> at 60 or something. It actually doesn't. Um, women, postmenopausal women that have had children do better. It's not that surprising, but but it still can be done. Yes, Are there please. any restrictions on OHIP funding? Is there any age restriction? Yeah. So can that's a, that's a very very good question. So that's one of the things we're trying to figure out now. So here's the thing, with embryo transfers, no, but to create embryos for IVF, as I talked about before, um, OHIP has taken the position of 43. Now the reason it's taken that is human fertility really, really, really does begin to plummet greatly uh, in the early 40s and really falls off. Having said that, there are spontaneous, spontaneous meaning well, you know what that means. That's, okay. There are, yeah. there are spontaneous, healthy pregnancies that have occurred. My grandmother was 48 when she had my mother. Um, these things happen, and lots of people within their families uh, know of, of at least mid-40 pregnancies that have been successful. Uh, they're not that common, but they can occur. But fertility falls off. So the thing with, from evidence-based medicine, they've drawn a line in the sand of 43. But here's the thing, everyone. If they've got embryos already, then the age is not the relevant factor. So I want to give you a case of why we would consider postmenopausal reproduction. Um, a young woman is, is 27 years old. Her and her partner very, very much want to have a child. Um, she's unable to conceive because she has massive scar tissue on her uterus from a previous infection. Her uterus is just not going to bear pregnancy. But she's healthy and well. She ovulates. Her husband has good sperm and a good sperm count. So, IVF, okay? They've got eggs. They've got sperm. The two go together. They've got very decent-looking, healthy embryos, okay? Now what do they do? They need to find someone to have a baby for them. In Canada, it's illegal to pay anyone. So you can't say, I'm going to save up $40,000 and pay somebody to have this baby. Um, if you have a sister, you could ask them, see how that goes over. Um, but, you know, a co-worker at the office, it's kind of pushing it, right? I mean, I mean how far can you stretch these relationships, right? Um, so... The mother, exactly. So now you've got a 58-year-old mother that says, mother of the daughter, okay, um, obviously, that she's had two children. Um, she's, her blood pressure is good. Her cardiac function is good. Her body weight is good. She's healthy and well. She's working. She says, I'll do it. Okay? And they do. And they do. And in many cases... These women in mid and late 50s are bearing pregnancy fairly well, and often they go to term. And, and so they are giving birth to their grandchild. They physically give birth to their grandchild. So then that child, it's so, you know, the concern with that is, is role relations may be very confused. But I'm not so sure. We don't have any evidence. We have no data on this. No data. It's way too soon for that. I'm not sure of that because the mother. And in this case, with her partner, the father would raise that child, and, and, you know, that would be their grandmother. And when the child is older, 
they would tell him or her how this occurred. Now, now you're already adding on 10 or more years, so it won't be as exotic as it is now. Okay? End of the world? I don't know. You've got other people, you know, there's, there's other people out there who, you know, younger husbands that haven't had children or whatever, and older women um, that are choosing uh, postmenopausal reproduction. Um, but, you know, the, a big ethical question is at what point does Canada, do private clinics, do public clinics like Mount Sinai simply say, we will not do this. We don't like it. Okay? Yes, please. I'm curious to know whether you know the sex of the embryos before they're implanted. Yeah. You, illegal in Canada. <laughs> illegal in Canada. The Americans can do it all the time. But under the Canada Reproductive Act of 2004, which is getting very old quickly because so much has changed, uh, we are not allowed ever using technology to determine the sex of an embryo. But there's an exception. If you've got a sex-linked disorder, like hemophilia, like a few other things, then in fact you can, okay? Because what's changing as well now is that the embryos can be examined under what's called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So not only do you look at the embryos to see which ones look healthy and well, you can start look, looking at the genetic sequences within the embryos, okay? So male and female, certainly. And we do do this. So if you take a disease like Huntington's, Huntington's chorea, a horrible, nasty affliction, and the chances if a person's carrying it, of it occurring, are 50-50. So a couple where, where you know, it, it, it's, they are potentially carrying, what they can do, rather than having children spontaneously, is have, let's say, six embryos created. They can then look at these six and say three are Huntington's free and three have Huntington's. They can then select the three that are Huntington's free. Now Huntington's is, is extreme. So most people would accept that because it's a painful, debilitating disease. But when we, st and we're not there yet, when we look at it and say, well, athletic ability, physical appearance, <laughs> That's when it all changes. That's when it all changes. We're not there yet because we don't have the technology, but we're getting much, much closer. So that is what could certainly occur with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, is to be able to look at that. Yeah? Um, there seems to be, as time goes by, more and more transgender people. Yeah. In this procedure and methodology, mm -hmm. Is there any effect? Is there any... There's many transgender people, absolutely, that are now have reproductive options that they didn't have before. And so we certainly do see transgender people that are coming to us for re reproductive assistance. But in determining the sex of the embryo... Oh, well, that kind of... Okay, so no. Sure? Oh, oh, like intersex. Okay. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. I thought you meant transgender people looking for options for reproduction. We absolutely see that. As well as same-sex couples making use of IVF, we see that completely acceptable within Canadian society. Countries Somewhere like France line, hate it. Yes, sir? I'm wondering if we've looked at any of the issues related to some sort of bizarre commercialization of embryos, like exporting them to God knows where. Yeah. Uh, that sort of thing. That well, we already... We already, that's already occurring. Um, now, Canada, it's illegal to sell eggs, sperm, embryos. Um, I forget, there's a list of things you're not supposed to sell. Wombs, yeah, but the Americans do. And so what you already see on websites for someone looking to purchase eggs. Now, why would someone want to purchase an egg? Usually because they have sperm to go with it and they're looking to create an embryo. Um, and then what you see is, is you know, college education, um, <laughs> athleticism, and what is remarkable is when you look at the ads, how many are blonde haired and blue eyed, and how many people want uh, offspring uh, that will be not just Caucasian, but blonde haired and blue eyed. And tall. Yeah, tall, athletic, good, and, and so then you pay for those eggs that you're paying 40,000 US dollars or something. Uh, so, you know, there's an element of eugenics to this, in which we are looking at creating uh, genetically improved people. 
I think I don't need to tell you when the last time a Western society went down this road was under the Third Reich, okay? That's the last time we ever went down this road. And, um, and it actually wasn't just Germany, it was a lot of countries including Canada. I don't mean to the extreme of the genocide, but I mean eugenics, meaning looking at the genetic health, and it, which is enormously tied to social judgment and elitism and sexism and racism and all kinds of things. But Canada was on board with that, not the genocide, the mass genocide. That was under the Third Reich. There was a question? Yeah. Central health issues. Um, I'm really um, heartened to hear that Canada has standards. It brings to mind the question uh, of who makes the decision and at what level. Is it, are the hospitals autonomous or is it, does it go to a provincial body or a federal body? How, well, first of all, most of, very few hospitals have reproductive clinics. Most are private in Canada. Um, it's changing, like, one of the only ones is the one I work in, which is at Mount Sinai. Um, so private is often much more tied to business models. Um, so generally, you know, what, generally from a human rights point of view, in Canadian society, we would not interfere with people's reproductive choices unless something was glaringly wrong. I mean, if someone was, you know, psychotic or clearly unable to care for a child physically or there was concern with abuse, uh, then in fact we would put the brakes on. But in terms of social judgments, not so much. Um, you know, adoption has very rigid models in terms of how you know, you need to be, what age, what income, I don't know what it's like these days, I'm thinking of older days, but someone would come to the door and see if your counters were clean and how you ran a house and, you know, like it, it was pretty close to that, right? Okay, it's not the same model with that. And the ethical questions get tough, like with IVF, so someone comes to us and the woman has had cancer three times, major cancers, aggressive cancers. And after a lot of soul searching, she and her partner have decided to have a child, and they'll need fertility assistance and IVF to do it. Now, we could say, we're concerned you may not live long enough to raise a child, we're worried about your health. But these are really social judgments, right? Is that our business, or is that the business of this couple to make those decisions for themselves, right? These are the tricky, tricky situations. Yes, please. Uh, along that vein, there was a recent article in the National Post of the year end that looked at future trends and the, the future the five top people, the five top issues. And they looked at, I'd actually written it down so I don't forget, mitochondrial replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not allowed in Canada, but they've allowed the procedure in the are you able to comment on that somewhat? Mitochondrial, yeah, the science is a little tricky, but I know the science, I just, I'm hoping not to, everyone has to pay attention here. <laughs> okay. It's called three-person reproduction. Brace yourself. Okay, three parents. Um, now, why on earth would you want three parents? Two is plenty. Um, but what it is, is, is you would take the, the egg, and the mitochondria is, is essentially the power source of the, of the egg. So the mitochondria is the layer around the outside, which is the power source. It has a very, very small amount of genetic material, a small percentage. But for some women, they're carrying this, the mitochondria produces disability and illness within the children to be born. So you need to get rid of the mitochondria. So what you do is you take an egg and you take your own genetic material out of the egg and you take somebody else's egg and you put in your material into someone else's egg that has healthy mitochondria. But a small, an absolute minuscule amount of the DNA within that is from, so you've got DNA essentially from two different women and one man. Okay, so you actually now have three people involved in this. It's too much for a lot of countries. Britain is moving forward with it, okay? But when you look at ancestry, I, I'm very conflicted on this one. It's very, very tough. Um, when you look at ancestry studies, where we came from, who we are, our immigration from Africa, this is mitochondrial DNA they're looking at. So we could say it's irrelevant, it's meaningless, but it obviously means a lot to us. 
The other thing is that stays in the germline. If a healthy child is born from that, that mitochondria DNA is passed down for thousands, however long humans are going to exist, I don't know, um, but it keeps carrying on. So you have permanently altered the DNA and the germline, germline means inherited, indefinitely you have altered the DNA. So it's a big one, but that's mitochondrial. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier screening for Huntington's disease. Yes. Um, is it possible to screen for any other uh, illnesses? Yes, yeah, single gene mutations you can, but now it's getting to the point where you, you get something called, we think there might be something going on, but we're not sure. So you get, now that there's the whole genome has been sequenced, you, you're in a position often with an embryo where you can look at the entire genome. So what you could say is we're seeing genetic markers, and we, we've seen let's say six different genetic markers uh, that have might, might have an association with autism, but we're not sure, um, but you've got them. So now this, so to say to a, and this could be IVF, or it could be to a woman who's already pregnant, let's say 11 or 12 weeks pregnant. So if you say to a woman early in pregnancy, we think we see a pattern of autism, but we're not sure, don't worry about it, go home and relax. <laughs> How do you think that goes? Yeah. I, I, and you know, is, is it an enormous injustice when you're not sure to say we think there might be? Single gene mutations like Huntington's are very, very clear, or trisomy 21 Down syndrome, those types of things, very clear. But what with genome sequencing, the other thing is you see an abnormality. You see a sequence that's out of whack. You then report to the mother-to-be that we see something out of alignment, but by the way, we have no idea what it means. Okay. These are not good things to be saying to women expecting a baby. Uh, you know, and the argument would be they have a fundamental right to know, and I respect that. But you're also dropping a, 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 a big, nasty thing in their lap, and there's nothing they can do about it. There is something they can do about it. If they're frightened enough, they can end the pregnancy easily. They could say, you know, I'm not willing to risk autism. I don't know what this stuff means. Uh, let's try again. Let's end the pregnancy. So, as we know, abortion is legal in Canada, but having said that, nobody wants to see more of it. I mean, it's a very difficult social issue, and uh, we have no intention of encouraging more. But that's the trick with the amount of genetic information coming forward, is we're not sure what it means, but here's what we think might be going on. See, the argument would be... Yes, sorry. I have a question, sir, sure. from the other angle. Yeah. Have you read Andrew Solomon's Far From the Tree? No, but I've been told about it a lots of times, and I heard him speak. Haven't read it okay. yet. I heard it's great. Okay, yes. so I can't remember if I'm altering this story, if this is what the people wished for, or if they actually could do it. And I'm wondering if you could do it in Canada. So, uh, one of the chapters is on deaf culture. So there's yeah. a deaf couple, and for whatever reason, they need in vitro, and they want to have a deaf child. So... No, it is possible. It and is then, possible. It depends on what caused the deafness. So you, you have a couple that are deaf. Deaf. Mm -hmm. And um, they have in vitro fertilization and then they have pre implantation genetic diagnosis and the request is that we have a cultural and social identity of deafness. Therefore, out of these six embryos, we want you to select which one uh, will be deaf, and that is what we choose to have. So, purposely choosing to have a deaf child. Now, there are, this does not mean that all people who are deaf, hearing impaired, whatever it may be, feel this way. This is a, a subset of people. But saying that this is so much part of our identity, that we want to have a child who has the same a deafness that we have. It's not and fair to the child. Is that something that would be permitted in Canada? Or like, it's doing? still being, it's still being figured out. Um, but you know, the, you can see the opposite too, yeah. where where you know there's a child on the way from deaf parents, and they're told, 
this child is deaf as you are, and they say, no, we don't want this child to be born. Um, you know, it, it, so is one worse or better than the other, right? But this is what can occur now. But, you know, it, it's not so much permitting it. it it's, if a person is told that the baby on the way has whatever, you know, this is a free and mature democratic society. Any pregnant woman in this country that decides she does not want to carry a baby does not have to. And she's not on trial. So she can go forward and say, I need to end this pregnancy. And she is not on trial. But she won't be told if it, in a certain period of time, if it's a male or female, if it can be helped, right? But these other things... Well, I mean, what, what happens, the male-female thing is very tricky because right now it's usually ultrasound scans and it comes late in the pregnancy and then, you know, it's very, it's very hard to get a termination of pregnancy in Canada over like 20 weeks because it's just too far along. But, brace yourselves, it will soon be a blood test or even a urine test like sold at shoppers that's not only going to tell you if you're pregnant, but it's going to tell you whether there's a boy or a girl on the way. That could easily lead to a spike in termination of pregnancies for female children. So that is very close now, very close. Yeah? I'm curious, following up on the deaf question, if you were asked to choose an embryo that's going to be deaf or likely to be deaf, you would go ahead and do that? No, I don't think so. I don't so, think so. I so think that's up to your own ethics, or is that a legal issue? No, I, I think well, I, I think they could charge us, and it would have to be sorted out in the courts. But I don't think it's anything we'd be doing. Yeah. yeah. Anything to do with you know, like if it's a specific something like Huntington's, but deafness is is you know, it's not an illness in and of itself. I mean, the, the tough one too is trisomy twenty one Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. We don't have Canadian data, but American data shows that 85% of people with Down syndrome are now being terminated, meaning aborted. And you know, most of us have grown up around, I used to work with many children with various developmental delays, and it's a generalization perhaps, but people with Down syndrome can be the most loving, sweetest, positive people. I mean, in African, in some African societies, it's considered a huge blessing. Um, they are going to vanish um, because of all of this. And, you know, is that an illness or is that a variation on the human condition? You see Down syndrome in chimpanzees, gorillas. I mean, this is part of just, it's a, and they keep them. They raise them. They don't, you know, like it's, uh, it's really something what is coming very quickly. Yes, please. In terms of the leftover embryos, yes. has there been any discussion about... Um, it, banking some in the event of future cataclysm or possibly sending them to space with the manned missions or watching the fertility levels. Well, I know this must be like a sort of metaphysical, ethical discussion starting around these yeah. types of topics. No, it is. But to be honest with you, if the human race got wiped out tomorrow by nuclear war, God knows what's on its way, but probably not nuclear war. That's not very in these days, is it? Um, <laughs> environmental calamity, they're already there. Mm -hmm. They're in deep freeze now, and they don't need a power source. You don't need to plug them into the wall, so to speak, like your fridge. Okay? Um, it, it's more like a thermos that maintains, I know these analogies are weird, but what I mean is if we vanish tomorrow, my understanding is they are preserved, and if there were surviving groups of people, you could repopulate uh, from surviving embryos, but you'd have to deal with the ethics of that, to suddenly pull them all out and have them born. I mean, they're other people's embryos, right? You wouldn't have consent. Um, but they're there, and I, I predict they'll be there in a few hundred years because we are... Basically, we have, most people have made a decision, and society has made a decision, that we're going to do nothing about this one. Um, a lot of people say, just throw them out, but you know what? It's not going to happen. It's too ethically complicated. And you're not going to throw them out without consent. The parents can throw them out. Other people can't. Right? Yeah? Well, are they finding their way into science labs for, let's say, stem cells? Only with clear consent. Only when parents clearly consent. For that, there's absolutely zero ability for them to be used in any way uh, without clear consent. And that's a small percentage where consent for research is given. Now, I can't speak for what's going on 100 years from now. Well, let's say when the donors are gone and 
and then the and well, some of the donors are already gone. You mean dead gone? Yeah. 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 And who owns that embryo? Well, I sigh because I, this is something I have to face on a regular basis. The hospital, which does not love this at all, at all. They don't want anything. But what are they going to do? You know. Um, you, you, you don't want cryopreservation at home, right? Um, it's too, it has to be carefully monitored, but they are being respected. They're not being sold off, they're not being secretly discarded, they're being respected. And the Americans are warehousing hundreds of thousands of things. Yes, please. In that situation, if the parents have passed away, and the Hold their, mm -hmm. their survival or whatever. Yep, that's quite right. Yep. Then, how is that different than giving a child up for adoption? And after, if you're worried about intermarriage or whatever, if it's been two, three, four generations, whatever number is determined appropriate, yeah. why couldn't they be given to a couple who wants a baby and can't have by their own means? Well, you didn't have consent the first time, so you wouldn't be able to do it. So a child given up for but, adoption is given up for... But you don't have consent for, to keep them inevitably forever either. Well, you sort of do, because that's... You, you kind of do, because they're if told that if you do... If paying for it, for their upkeep, that legally means they have... Look, our lawyers tell us we have every right to get rid of them. Yeah. We're not doing it. And I shouldn't be saying this publicly, but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> yes. um, Oddly enough, would, would, would the hospital consult with the children's lawyer's office about various legal obligations? I, I assume you have your own legal counsel at the hospital, but I, I'm just... You know. Children's, meaning like child welfare children? No, no, there's an office that protects the children in Ontario. It's a, 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 it's a general yeah. legal duty to protect children. And it just seems to me that, that the issue that some, some people have been identifying is what's the yeah. future of these embryos. So I'm just uh, querying whether that... No, it's a good point. The Canadian legal position, though, on the moral status of embryos of the unborn is zero. Uh, Canada has never taken a position on that whatsoever. So even during pregnancy, we cannot involve anything to do with child welfare representation in any way, shape, or form, even in the late stages of pregnancy, because there's not a person until you have a living person by Canadian law. Now, other countries are different, okay? You can pull in child welfare in a pregnancy, not under Canadian law. Canada, you know, Canada struck down its abortion laws in the 80s, completely on the basis of the rights of Canadian women. Canada never, ever to this day has taken a position on the moral status of the unborn, ever. Yeah? Um, I'm kind of fixated on this best before thing. I know I should okay. <laughs> get over it. Um, what, well you said something before that really intrigued me, that there's the previous preservation techniques weren't as good. So what was the evidence of that? How did that? Poor outcomes. Poor outcomes. So outcome meaning pregnancy. That would be another. Yeah. Some of these embryos would never be born. You sometimes you dethaw them and they just sort of. I don't mean to be coarse, but they just kind of fall apart. They're no, they do. They just, you know, they're they're just not good. Yeah. Um, at opening night, there was a young woman who came up and spoke to me, and she had in her earlier life sold her eggs. Yeah. And she felt at the time what she called the industry had not told her that there might be possible repercussions for her own fertility in the future. Yeah. And when she tried to get pregnant later in her life, it wasn't possible. Yeah. So she now runs an advocacy organization for young women who might be inclined to sell their eggs. So my question is, can you say something around the industry? Yeah, no, and there is an industry for egg sales. And as much as it's illegal in Canada, uh, the internet exists. Mm -hmm. So the Ameri there's lots of stuff that can be bought and likely is being bought. To retrieve eggs from a woman, um, 
there needs to be stimulation of the ovaries, and there's a, there's an, I'm no expert on this, but there, you can get a, a hyperovulation syndrome reaction, which is pretty serious and pretty awful from that. So there are risks to women. Donating sperm for men is pretty straight. <laughs> I can remember the days of the University of Toronto gym where they would offer practically beer money for sperm. Like back in the 80s, they would from the sports teams because they you just had family doctors looking for sperm for, you know, that's what they used to do. Untrack the whole thing. So it's very different. But sperm is very different. Eggs is different because it, they need to be stimulated and they need to be... So, you know, the concern is the, the objectification and commodification of a woman's body. Mm -hmm. That you're commercializing a woman's body. So that's why Canada took a position and has the Canada Reproductive Act of 2004. But I must say, everyone, 2004, from a reproductive technology point of view, is really old really old. The act is collapsing, and don't be surprised if the act, if the act, that act I speak of, the Reproductive Act, collapses within the next year or two. And our government is not excited about redoing it, I'll tell you. It's too complicated. Yes, please. What do you do, how do you get donated eggs, then, for a woman who can't, hasn't gotten... You have to find... Technically, you have to find a kind person that's willing to donate those eggs. You have to, within your own world, you have to find someone that's willing to oh, do that. No. Yes. Yeah. You know? Tricky, huh? Yeah. Or the other thing you can do, it sounds like advice, I don't mean it as advice, but what some Canadians will simply do is the whole thing, just buy it, go to Pearson, just go down to the States, have everything done there, and come back here pregnant. Right? Just, I, that's, that's what a lot of people can do. Yes? So, it, this would be similar to kidney donation, living donation. You just have to have someone who will give you a kidney. Yeah, what's different though is this person has offspring in the world, and how do they feel about it? Mm, so, I think it can, get, no, it can get more complicated, but what you said about the female body, so it's really the stimulation that they have to, they have yeah. to induce a change yeah. to get the egg. That's right. So if you give a kidney, you just give a kidney. Yeah. But no, and giving a kidney is, is a kind and generous thing, as is potentially giving an egg. But what's different is someone donating an egg. You've got to be very clear. Biologically, yeah. you have a biological yeah. child out there. Some people would say, that's fine. I don't care. I, I just want to help people. They really don't care. Other people feel very differently about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. You could have a case in like in Howard Hughes case, uh, where you have some uh, previously unknown offspring of Howard Hughes. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want part of the estate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And postmenopausal women, they're not going to live that long. And if there's any problem, who pays? Yeah. We pay, uh, they, we pay for the maintenance. Yeah. Yeah, the courts haven't. I, you know, could offspring come after their parents and and try? They say maybe not, but it hasn't been tested in court. I also want to say, you know, the, the, all these movie stars that decide to just have a baby at 48 or something like that, they're cheating. It's IVF. Um, but they don't always say that, right? So, you know, like... Two comments on the questions about the commercialization in the industry around. Uh, as you made the point that in Canada it's illegal to pay the surrogate mother. Uh, and I'm not sure that's actually correct. I think you can pay, but it's limited to what is thought to be reasonable and not. It's very limited, like bus fare and food and like not major payments. But they don't go after that, like what those small payments are. So you can pay for kind of out-of-pocket expenses, medical appointments, some stuff to do with nutrition, but writing checks for thirty thousand dollars or something. But they don't monitor it very carefully. So two cases that I'm aware of that are more speak to this commercialization and mm -hmm. the trans-border tourism aspect of some of this. So a, a gay male couple uh, who bought eggs in the States through one of the websites that you're talking mm -hmm. about, then the surrogate, paid for a surrogate mother in another province and then had the child here mm -hmm. in Canada, and that surrogate mother was indeed some who had done this repeatedly. And was involved in that sort of business, so to speak. And then another example, which I found quite astounding, is uh, this has been traditional, but not traditional.
from, but up until last year, a very large industry in Bangkok and, and in the East was surrogacy. Yes, where, I saw that. Where yeah. an example, um, the case I'm <laughs> describing is an HIV-infected man who wanted to have a child. Yeah. And he could go to the States and have sperm washing and, and do IVF, but it's extraordinarily expensive. Mm -hmm. Very limited resources in Canada, if any. Uh, and he went to Bangkok to have it done. Uh, last year, and a week before, uh, they had a very robust industry, a week before they closed the camp, <coughs> and the government stepped in because there was a lot of private hospitals doing it in Bangkok. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is they had a number of reports and complaints where uh, disabled children were being born, and then the people, the foreigners, would leave and not yeah. take the children. Yeah. And yeah. An yeah. Someone from Japan, yeah. or their 12 children, or something like that. Yeah, we're, we're in a whole new... Yeah, I, our time's just split up. We're in a whole new era with this, but um, we will manage. I mean, we need to use our, our heads and we need to use our hearts and move through this as best we can. Um, I can't believe the attendance. This is amazing. I, I enjoy the play. I think it's time to go down, isn't it, Anne? Yeah. It is. So thank you very, very much.